everybody. I'm Michelle Rosecrans from the Miami University Alumni Association, and I'm so excited to welcome you to this session of Winter College 2021. For more than 17 years, Winter College has been the Alumni Association's premier alumni ed education event, and we're just really glad to be able to bring it to a broader audience this year in our virtual format. Um, we do have a really great lineup for these two days, today and tomorrow, and you can navigate through the full schedule um, on this website, Alum LC, um, by clicking events by type on the top toolbar and selecting Winter College 2021 from the drop down menu. Feel free to even join programs while they're in progress. And if you can't make it to all of them, know that sessions are being recorded and are posted online um, soon after they end. The only exception is tonight's social event, which is full and won't be recorded. Our session this hour is Reimagining the American Street, presented by David Prithurch. Dr. David Prithurch is a professor uh, in the Department of Geography, where he advises and teaches in Miami's urban and regional planning major. He has a BS in geography from Penn State and an MA and PhD from the University of Arizona. David is an urban geographer interested in planning and sustainability with recent books, including Law, Engineering, and the American Right of Way, Imagining a More Just Street. He serves the Oxford City Council and Miami's Climate Action Steering Committee, and he enjoys the carbon freedom of living in a walkable and bikeable community like Oxford. With that, we will get started. And I wanted to note that uh, if you've used it, uh, if you've participated in any of these sessions in the past, typically there's a button that says ask a question. Today, uh, we're uh, using a little bit different format. You'll see there's a tiny URL that you click on to submit questions, but we are still welcoming your questions. Um, and in fact, there'll be a couple of interactive uh, elements of the presentation today where doc Dr. Prithurch will be soliciting feedback from you. So please make sure that you um, find that link so that you can submit your feedback. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Prithurch. Okay, uh, let me share my screen here. Um, and uh, I really wanna thank everyone for being here. I'm particularly, it's honored, I'm honored to uh, be part of uh, Alumni Winter College and thanks to everyone, Michelle and Emily for everybody for making it happen, um, but also for, for inviting me and to everyone who's taken the time of being here today. All right, so uh, Michelle and Emily, are you guys good to see what I'm seeing here? on the screen? Okay. We are, yes. All right, great, thank you. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about how we might um, reimagine the American street. Um, streets connect people and places and we navigate them daily. Uh, they connect our driveways with the rest of our community and the rest of the continent, but we don't often think about them. Uh, they're just there, uh, but it turns out they're everywhere and we use them all the time. So the first little interactive part is, is I'm kind of curious, uh, people are coming from diverse places. When you think about the street, the street in front of your house, uh, what comes to mind? Um, and so uh, if you guys could put in uh, the, the link that Michelle said to just kind of be adjectives, like when you think of a street, what do you think of? How do you use it? So when you have any responses, Michelle, come in. Um, and here's an image to prompt you. This happens to be Locust Street in Oxford. Uh, and you could respond to this image or think about your own, you know, cul-de-sac outside your driveway. Has anyone been able to chime in yet, Michelle? We have them coming through, and it, <laughs> David, we told you earlier that we thought we had all our technical difficulties of Winter College settled out. It looks like we're having a little bit here. If you are trying to tune in and you can see the captioning, please do use the YouTube link that we have added to the page. Um, David, we'll just keep going because this will be recorded and folks can click through um, and join us on YouTube. But okay. I will tell you, <laughs> how about we take two experiences from me? I grew up All in right. a small town where I lived right on a highway um, into the small town. And now I live in Cincinnati and I'm on a cul-de-sac, which once I became a parent, I realized that that's highly desirable. Um, and in fact, our friends from around the neighborhood who don't live on our cul-de-sac have um, often come over when their kids are ready to learn to ride a bike. So that's what I'm doing. And then my um, 
my mom grew up out in the country, uh, you know, on a farm with a road right in front of the house. But, you know, roads, it's cool. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, yeah, ideally in the future, we'll all be in the same room together. And we won't need technology to mediate our going back and forth, but we do the best that we can. Um, so, so streets, we typically use them for transportation, right? We think about them as as places to get us from point A to point B. Um, we typically drive on them and they're engineered that way. They are transport infrastructure uh, engineered for vehicular flow. But if we think about it, um, is that uh, the streets serve diverse ways of getting around, for example, walking to school or biking to school, or as Michelle talked about that, we might use the cul-de-sac for street hockey. Because it turns out that not only do streets serve lots of different ways of getting around, but they are also public spaces. They are most extensive public spaces. If you, if you think about streets, and if you think about them as the acreage of them, if they were a park system, they'd likely to be the biggest park system in your community. They'd be the biggest plaza in your community. But they're often underutilized, and, and you'll see what I mean today. It's that we use them for very specific narrow functions, um, but they're, you know, those are kind of their narrow functions. All right, great. So, so this is a big question for me that came out of a, a life of walking and biking and driving and using streets and, and, and thinking about streets more de deeply. Like, what do we think about streets and why? And, and how might we think about them differently? And, and to me, I'm interested in the big picture kind of theoretical stuff, but also like in practice, um, how can we design streets differently? And this is going to raise some questions that are uh, that maybe you guys raised in, in is thinking about well who are streets for what are they for so that's kind of the my most most recent book is kind of an exploration of those different things okay you guys could ask the question hey wait this guy is a well we could just ask the question why like why should we care about streets and this guy is a geographer. Why does ge why do geographers think about streets? I thought that was like traffic engineers. Well, many of you guys have had geography classes and you will know that geography is the study of places and relationships between people and their environments. Um, it's about spatial relations. And if you think about streets, they have a geography, right? You know, like there is a geography to the street, just like there's a geography territory, um, and streets do involve us relating with other people and our environment. So that's kind of just conceptually, geog geographers should look at streets. But geographers are not just interested in things because they're interesting. Often geographers are thinking about global things, global concerns. And um, as Michelle mentioned, I've been involved in sustainability and, and climate action on campus, and it turns out that geographers have long been interested in and worried about climate change, that we're altering our climate in a way that's fundamentally altering our planet and the future, and that's a really big concern. Um, but in addition to analyzing the problem, like, wow, we have too much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and we're putting too much in, how do we do put less out? Uh, greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, that raises the question of sustainability. How can we imagine a better future? Um, and I'll show you this graph because it's an important one. That shows what the scientists say our emissions curve needs to be, that we basically need to get to zero um, emissions by 2050. That's a big challenge, but geographers are okay with the big picture stuff like that. So let's say we're worried about something like uh, something interesting like climate change uh, and we want to get our emissions down. We want a more sustainable planet. Well, I also teach in an urban planning program and that means trying to understand and analyze problems. OK, um, so, you know, if we're worried, if we're trying to get our emissions to zero, we need to figure out where those emissions come from. And this graph tells you two different things. One is that we Americans are in the top five per capita of people who worst emitters on the planet. Okay, so okay, where are all those emissions coming from? Well, the single largest sector of emissions in the United States is transportation. So the biggest chunk of the problem pie is transportation. So if we wanna get to neutrality, we have to figure out how to do something different with transportation. All right, so uh, that leads us to understanding, well, where do all those emissions come from? You guys could guess because I'm going to guess that the way you use streets is the way I, I and most people Americans in America use streets. 
if you ask Americans how they get from point A to point B, 80 plus percent of Americans are, or, or, or of trips are made by cars. Those cars are powered by fossil fuels, right? Uh, way down the list is walking, mainly in cities like Boston and New York and Chicago or San Francisco. Um, way, way down the list is transit and then there's other stuff. So, um, all right, so yeah. Uh, so what we have here is, is a, a country that relies on cars to get everywhere where we need to go and those cars produce emissions. Um, Let's say maybe you're not such an environmentalist, but you care about um, public health. Well, I'm, I love geography because everything's interconnected. That the rise of, of, of vehicle miles traveled in the United States, the reliance on cars, tends to correlate, not surprisingly, with obesity. You know, if a, if if our weight is the product of our exercise, uh, energy burned versus energy consumed, if we're driving everywhere, we're not burning calories like we used to. And you know that even includes kids. Many of us, uh, and, and I'm assuming those of you guys are alumni. If you're my age or or older, uh, you know, 50 years ago, 85% of kids walked to school, and only 15% drove or were bused. Today, it's flipped the other way around. The 85% of kids are being driven. Most of them in private vehicles, not even on buses. So we can't be surprised that we have a problem. And and the last big problem that geographers are interested in is the question of social justice. Um, this is something people have been talking a lot about the last year, particularly in relation to policing. But if we think about stuff like the roadway, something like 13 people are killed, struck by cars and killed daily in the United States. Emily just put in chat that she thinks of streets in terms of danger. She lives in New Jersey. 13 people are killed every day in the United States by cars. Um, and disproportionately, those people are elderly, they're children, they're minorities, and they're the poor. So anyway, um, you know. Hey, David, we've yeah. actually had some more comments come in I wanted to share with you. We were All right, thank you. So what are other people saying? Yeah, that was actually Jeffrey in New Jersey who said he thinks of danger when he thinks of streets, which is really appropriate with what you were just saying. We also had Debbie who said it's a connector to her neighbors. Mimi said, uh, you know, for her, she sits on her porch walking her, watching her neighbors walk by on the street. Uh, and then B.W. Patrick said that they're good uh, at uh, delineating um, areas. So. Okay, awesome. You guys are thinking yeah. like geographers. Yes. Uh, Mark also said streets equal cars. <laughs> so. All right. Mark gets my point here is, is that's really true. Um, yes. Awesome. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Let's say we want to get back to maybe where we were in the past, which not everyone drove everywhere all the time. It turns out that half of all the trips we take are less than three miles. If you look at this chart, 28% of our trips are less than a mile. Um, those trips that are three miles or less, 60% of those are by car. So we're driving relatively short distances, maybe for some of the reasons that you're talking about. So bottom line, we're saying we need less of this. We need more of this and we need more of this. And if it sounds crazy, you guys are all familiar with Oxford and you know that a lot of places where we live are actually potentially quite walkable and bikeable. They're not, you know, Oxford three miles in diameter covers the whole thing. So I could ask the question that you guys have already started to chip into, which is why don't people just get off their lazy butts and walk or ride? Um, and so let's put this out to people again and see, I think you guys are already, uh, you know, Jeff in New Jersey said the streets are dangerous. Um, so why don't people just walk or ride? Why don't we maybe as individuals not walk or bike or ride transit more often? If it's if it's such a good sustainable thing and it's good for our health and it's good for the planet and it's good for kids, why don't we just walk or bike or ride? What do the streets have to do with it? So anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, um, while we're waiting for those to come in, um, so I, I'll, I'll give my, my, my streets um, experience again while we're waiting for some answers to come in. Well, actually, Barbara says there are no sidewalks to walk on where she is. And that was the case of where I grew up in a really small town. Um, so learn, we learned to, um, you know, ride our bikes safely on the side of the road. 
Um, and I would say now, you know, I walk, um, but more for leisure or over to my neighbor's house to safely hang out in the open air of the backyard. Um, Debbie says, we're always in a hurry. And yeah. I'll be honest, that, you know, has affected me a lot of the time. Like when I was working in Oxford, I've been working remotely um, for, you know, uh, a year now. And there were times when I'd ask a coworker, can you please take me to the building across campus and drop me off because I've got a meeting right before this, trying to get to the very next meeting. Um, Kent says uh, safety concerns for him. Mike says sometimes the distance from his destination is just too far to bike or to, to walk. Um, another person says not enough time. It really does seem like it's time, a lack of sidewalks and uh, Someone else says no bike lanes. So unless you're protected in a bike lane, sometimes it can be dangerous and not worth it. So a lot of great responses from everybody. Thank awesome. And this is what's so fun to talk about this stuff because we yeah. all use the streets all the time. So we have direct experience with this stuff and we're all making individual choices about how to get from point A to point B. And sometimes it's because the distance mm -hmm. is too far for walking to be practical. Sometimes Here are a couple others. Walk, but Just there's so you know. no sidewalks. Yeah. So what else are people so saying? We also have a couple of people saying another one who said streets are just too dangerous for bikes. That was Ann. Rob says when he went to Miami, you couldn't have a car unless you lived off campus. And um, someone else noted that in the United States, we've been conditioned to drive and perhaps have become lazy in that sense. And I think that your presentation touches on how the world's been built around driving. And All right. So, and, and that's the perfect segue right there. Which going, is, going. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's complicated. And, and so part of it's about individual choice. But if you guys have pointed out, a lot of it's in the structure of where we live. And that's as an urban geography, why that's interesting. So what I'm going to do in just two minutes is let you know that the geographers, like other scholars, are thinking about these issues kind of at a at a theoretical level in addition to the practical level. So I'm gonna give you a real quick drive by on what geographers are talking about these days, which is that geographers have always been interested in transportation and mobility because it's, it's, it's key to the geography of places. Like Cincinnati is where it is because of the transportation network of the Ohio River. So it's about spatial interaction in place. But transportation is not just like a good, some neutral thing. It turns out it's kind of political that like, you know, we're interacting with other people who gets access and who doesn't get access. There's a political dimension to it. And, and it's not always fair, you know, that some people get more access than other people. Um, and we experience streets in very direct ways. So these are things that um, social scientists like sociology and geography are now kind of cutting into those topics that in the past were just engineering conversations. Cause it's not just, we're not just, a hydraulic fluid where people right in those in those channels so once you start thinking about streets as public spaces you start saying well who should have a right to them and this is a broad and long tradition in geography of thinking both philosophically about like who has a right to the city who gets to be central who gets to interact with each other who gets access to public spaces and within that is what we call legal geographies which is okay who's got a legal right to, to circulate through space. All right, so these are things that geographers are talking about a lot, which is all leading up to a field that I've been engaged in, which is something called mobility justice. We can talk about social justice, but what about mobility? Um, so a number of us have been trying to define what we mean by a fair distribution of mobility. And, and that would mean that everyone has some, there would be equitable rights. There would be equity and benefits and burdens too. And also who gets to participate in decision-making. So again, this is this idea of, of, of combining what used to be like a, a, an infrastructure engineering conversation with kind of big philosophical values-based questions. All right, um, so uh, awesome. So we got different people where they live are commenting on how different it is. So how is it that the streets got designed the way they are? All right, so this is a history that I've been trying to understand as a scholar. And, and let's talk about the street and the geography of streets. First basic idea, streets are public spaces. They're owned by the government for public uses. But for the last century, that range of uses, once upon a time, 100 years ago, those uses could include markets and playing and, and, and travel, it has been more narrowly defined by the law over the last century through something called the National Uniform Vehicle Code as the street 
is defined as for the purposes of vehicular travel. There was a whole battle in the 1920s when the car came in and who was going to win? Well, the car won and the street was redefined for the purposes of vehicular travel. We then have laws like traffic laws that, that, that kind of structure that geography of the street. So we have motor vehicle statutes that, for example, define that there are roadways and those are for vehicular travel. Okay, then there are sidewalks, and those are for pedestrians, if the sidewalk's there. And then there are these crosswalks, which are kind of in the middle, uh, that pedestrians can use them, but cars can drive over them. So there's a geography to all this. Interestingly, if we then start to say, well, who has rights to the public space? That's defined in the law as something called the right of way. And we experience this all the time. And when you take a driver's license test, you learn this term. Legally, it's an interesting idea. Like, who gets the right to proceed uninterruptedly in preference to another, which basically means who must yield to whom. Remember I was saying that uh, mobility is political? It's pretty political. Who gets to go and who must stop? So the law will say, for example, pedestrians have to yield the right of way on the roadway. It's not your space. On the crosswalk, drivers are supposed to yield right of way to pedestrians in or approaching their lane. And on the sidewalk, that's a pedestrian space. So that's the law, but it's not just lawyers and legislators who shape the streets, engineers get in the business too. So those ideas about what streets are for have been engineered, and some of you guys out there may be engineers and know more about this than I do, just like many of you guys may be lawyers and know more about the law. But geographers, we, we dabble in lots of different things. So I've been reading engineering manuals, and there are these manuals of what they call geometric design, which is the geometry of if you have a car and what's the turning radius and how do you design the space around the car. And the purpose statement, again, is pretty clear for the operational efficiency, comfort, safety, and convenience of the motorist. So that's what streets are designed for. In the language uh, of all this, um, the, the engineering does accommodate other modes. So there are separate manuals for pedestrians and bikes, but, but in the language of engineering, the car is kind of engineered for, and these other modes are accommodated, maybe voluntarily. And then the final piece of this is that once the street is engineered, then the roadway needs to be controlled. And there are these manuals called Uniform Traffic Control, control Device Manuals that basically promote safety, high, highway safety and efficiency to provide orderly movement. And so if you get inside of these things, you can download them. Um, you know, they'll have guides on signage, which inform, warn, and guide, and markings, which define and delineate, and signals, which assign right away. Okay, that again is that that political dimension. My analysis of spending all this time in laws and engineering leads me to the conclusion that I probably already had going in from being a pedestrian and cyclist, which is that it's just not really fair the way the system's set up, okay? That, that, that the roadway, at least in theory, is for all modes, but it really prioritizes the car and pedestrians and brakes may be accommodated, but not necessarily. So if we apply that theory of what, what equity would be, it's not really equitable, okay? Particularly if we think about the fact that the most vulnerable users are put in the most danger. So that's kind of a problem, all right? And it helps explain why we don't walk or bike and why our, we don't let our kids walk and bike to school and why we drive even short distances. So that's the problem. But the planner in me says, all right, what do you do about it? Okay, so there's been a movement over the last 20 years or so in which a group of people got together and it started out with transportation advocates like, you know, the American Legal Bicyclists, but they joined forces with people like the AARP, you know, because the AARP was concerned that, for example, seniors are, retired people are a little more vulnerable on the streets, that some people might lose their licenses and will they be able to safely walk to the library? So they joined together in something called a complete streets movement. And their argument is pretty simple, and it's a value-based ethics argument, that streets are legally should accommodate everyone, that streets are paid for by everyone. Um, yes, gas taxes pay for a lot of our streets, but local streets, like the one in front of your house, is probably paid for out of the general fund uh, in your municipality. And those taxes are paid for ev by everyone, whether or not they drive or not. So everybody is paying for and has a legal right to use streets. 
we should design streets to accommodate everyone. And in their language, uh, a street that doesn't accommodate everyone is what they call incomplete. Okay. Um, so, so their argument is an ethical argument that pedestrians and cyclists are equally deserving of safe facilities to accommodate their travel. Um, and we've got a question from Rob. I think we want to come back to this uh, about what does all of this virtual stuff mean to the streets? Uh, the streets are very dynamic and, and it's a good question. All right. So the movement is now to ask the question, what, 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 what do we mean by complete streets? What would a complete street look like? Well, these guys are maybe not philosophers, but they're using a principle of equity, which is that the street should serve all users. It should serve a diversity of users, but particularly the vulnerable and underserved. And that's a key, you know, whether whether it's a religious ethics, you know, the, um, or or political ethics. The idea is it's not just a level playing field, but you've got to worry up, worry for the most vulnerable, the children, the disabled. Um, the 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 theory is is it's not just you just you just don't do the ethical things sometimes that all streets should should um, be committed to this um, vision. And if you're going to make exceptions, it's not just because, oh, we didn't have enough money to put the sidewalk in. No, it needs to be because, okay, well, how do you rebalance the budget to, to do it? And if, it's, if it really can't be done, it, you have to have a reason. One of the things uh, they're looking at here is that maybe it shouldn't just be the engineers deciding the streets, maybe planners and other people in the community too, and that we should really apply design best practices. Okay, so that's the theory. So what does that look like in practice? And many of you guys have seen these elements around your community. So the, the engineering manuals, it literally is built into the, the name of them, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. Our roadways have been engineered like highways. City planners know that, well, you know, local streets not all as a highway. It, it serves other functions like people's front porches are on the streets. So what they've done is, there, this is a great, you can Google NACDO and you can find these great images of how you can transform your streets with engineering. And it starts with intermodal equity, providing equity, fairness among how people get around. But over time, you can transform streets so they're not only fair for all the traveling public, but, but do they serve and contribute to the livability of the neighborhood? You could widen the sidewalks, which is good for pedestrians, but also opens up space for street trees and you can have cafes. And yeah, the cars can still drive on the street, but they're balanced among all these different modes. What's really interesting to me is that this has moved beyond just, again, just equity among different ways of getting around to thinking about, well, what if we flipped it around? Like, why does the, why does the pedestrian need to yield to the car? You know, what if we had streets in which the car yielded to the pedestrian and, and everyone shared the street um, where it's appropriate, of course. And, and the biggest, most profound thing is people are starting to eye all of that real estate that's dedicated to streets for travel and parking and saying, well, geez, we kind of need space for outdoor dining. COVID in particular has made this really, really, really important. Like if we want to increase the number of outdoor spaces that we have, where do we find it? Well, it turns out a lot of the underutilized parking is kind of, you know, maybe we can rethink that. Or we're, we, we're looking for places to create plazas like they did in Times Square in New York. Maybe the highest and best use of Times Square is not a vehicular intersection, but a public place. So. What I'd like to do uh, is, is to round this out, and then we can get to questions and discussion, is um, that's in theory, right? That's the theory of the complete street. That's the theory of mobility, justice, and equity. And there are all these cool policies out there. But roadways aren't made of policy. Roadways are made of asphalt and concrete and markings and signals. So, And those streets, that once upon a time were places where you could roll a hoop down or, you know, set up your vegetable cart. Over a hundred years, we've we've engineered the asphalt and the concrete to make them really good at moving cars. Um, so changing them is going to take some time. So how do you do that? Well, I'll tell you about some efforts on campus. Maybe you've been on campus in the last few years and have seen these. So Miami, for example, since 2011 
has had a circulation master plan. Um, they started moving dorms across 27 into um, former Western campus. And, and they realized that getting across Patterson for all those kids was kind of dangerous. So they said, we need to rethink how we move people around. So they developed a, a circulation master plan and its goals are very much like complete streets goals that improve safety and convenience for pedestrians, consider all non-motorized travel modes, um, consider the interface between motorized and, and then balance parking. So it's about balance. And they developed this map that said, well, we never had any bike infrastructure on campus at all. And, and the traditions of biking had kind of been lost on campus. And how do we get it back? Well, maybe we need to build some infrastructure to make it safe for people. So, you know, it took 30 years of battle um, with, uh, but, but bike lanes, if you've seen bike lanes on Spring Street, the Spring Street's a key corridor. Um, and so buffered bike lanes so people can bike or scoot safely off the side. Um, you maybe have seen on Patterson Avenue that we used to have little sidewalks that had really beaten paths off the side. That was because they weren't big enough. So we widened the sidewalks so that people and bikes and scooters and Gators um, run by physical facilities can navigate safely along the roadway. Um, it, it's not cheap, but it's an investment. And Miami went to this big widened sidewalk and instantly realized they weren't even big enough because so many people were walking and biking that we just had been undersizing that infrastructure. Um, some of you guys may have seen this. This is one of the most controversial things in Oxford if you drive. Uh, and pedestrians are frustrated with it too sometimes. The intersection at 27, 73 in Patterson is one of the most gnarly intersections uh, in terms of all the comp complex things going on. They created an all pedestrian traffic um, phase, which this means that you have to wait longer when you get to the signal, but while you, when you wait, you then get a phase where there are no cars moving through the intersection at all and the pedestrians can just go. Used to be you could walk across, but you'd have to dodge a car at your left, it was turning right, and and it was not safe. And so this is just a way, again, of balancing. So pedestrians should be able to enjoy that right of way in the crosswalk without having to worry about get running over by an impatient person trying to turn right or left. Um, you may have noticed that once upon a time, we had these big wide turning lanes up the middle of Patterson Avenue. Um, they converted those into landscape beds, which are really quite beautiful. That slows the traffic down, but the most important thing is it allows people to get across the street. You know, maybe if it's really, really busy, you get halfway across and then you get the rest of the way across. Um, there are now these rapid fire beacons where you push a button, it flashes so the cars know they have to yield to you. Um, and so that's been done on Patterson Avenue and is this summer going to be done all the way the rest of Patterson Avenue onto High Street. Um, and some of it's what um, traffic engineers call traffic calming, which is using things like textured pavements. So if you're driving in off the highway and you're going 45 or 50, when you hit campus now, the engineering tells you to slow down, okay, because it gets a little more narrower, there's a gate, and you know you're in a pedestrian zone. And so Miami has invested a lot for the safety. You know, you could put police officers up all day long. If the road is too wide, the cars will go too fast. But if you narrow the roadway and, and, and create all this visual interest, cars will slow down. And so if there is an accident, you know, you're talking about a pedestrian getting into an accident with a, a car at 25 miles an hour instead of 50. All right, um, before we conclude, I'm on Oxford City Council. I typically I have one foot on campus and one foot off. Um, the city of Oxford is equally committed to walkability. Our plan, we have a comprehensive a plan that talks about a quality accessible transportation system with alternative forms for a diverse population. So what does that mean for us? Well, we have plans for ultimately creating a network of bikeable and walkable streets so that you should be able to bike around and walk around Oxford safely uh, through this network of, of safe, enhanced, complete streets. All right, so what does that mean in practice? Um, if you've been through Oxford, you've seen these rapid fire beacons where, again, uh, the pedestrian has the right of way in the crosswalk, but usually people don't stop if they don't have to. So this flashes and it helps you use your right of way. So this is on Oxford Riley Road. Some of you guys may have seen these features, these things called sharrows or shared use arrows. And this is meant to communicate to motorists that, hey, 
bicycles have a right to the street. And when there's not enough space for bike lane, the bike may use the vehicular lane. You may have to go slow behind them, but the bicycles have that right. And that's kind of a way that you can communicate the law through engineering. Um, we have bike lanes on some of our busiest streets like Locust Street, and we even have these things called bike boxes. And the logic of the bike box is that it's really hard to turn left from a bike lane that's on the right side of the street because you have to cut across the cars. But with the bike box, when all the cars are stopped, you can turn left, get out in front of the cars, and when the light turns green, you can go. It's a little engineering feature that makes it easier for bicycles to use and uh, you know, fulfill and actualize their rights to the street. Um, and while it's not exactly streets, one of the most exciting things happening in Oxford, if you haven't been here lately, is we've been building this thing called the Oxford Area Trail System, um, which is an idea people have been talking about for decades. But sometimes people don't want to be, they want to travel, but they don't want to go on streets at all. So we've added to our transportation network a series of multi-use pathways, and many of you guys have these in your communities. It's new for us in Oxford. So we've created now you can bike from the uh, Black Covered Bridge underneath 732 to Leonard Howell Park near the stadium. And we just opened up another phase. This is my daughter, Vivian, commenting on the engineering of the street signs. And my wife, Kathleen, walking across a new bridge on 73. You can now walk or bike from from 73 near um, the DeWitt cabin all the way down to Pepper Park um, and people just love it. And we actually have a plan for, you know, we bu we've built this section, we, th we didn't build connect to this section in 2020 and 2021, whoops, we're going to pave uh, this path um, back behind the horse um, pastures and there's actually gonna be a connector up to the high school. So you can go on a paved pathway all the way around the Eastern side of Oxford for recreation or transportation. We're gonna build another one from the middle school out to here and then someday we'll figure out how to get across the railroad tracks. All right, so um, I'm gonna wrap up my portion of it here because I'm looking forward to what your thoughts are on all this. But basically, I just want to pull this back to the power of, of geography. Um, and we don't always think about geography having to do with, uh, you know, we think about geography and maps if we think about geography at all. But geography is about understanding how places work. And that knowledge is essential for figuring out how to build more just places, more livable, vibrant places, and more sustainable places. So I love working, for example, working with students um, who are so interested in these issues, who care a lot about the planet, because it's fun. It's intellectually interesting to understand how the world works. But you can use that knowledge, ultimately, to build better places. Um, you can't build better places unless you know how places work in the first place. Um, and, and to me, that starts with reimagining mobility and our streets. Uh, those streets are everywhere. We use them every day. They are a huge investment of resources. And they have so much potential to be more and do more. Um, so, so to me, that's the exciting part of getting to teach at Miami, uh, is, is to be able to research these things in theory, to teach about them in the classroom, and then try to to build those that infrastructure and that better Oxford and Miami um, through my service. So th that's what I'm all about um, and what my obsessions are. So I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say. And so, yeah, um, you know, I'm just kind of opening it up to questions in general. Um, uh, while you guys are typing those in, um, I saw that Rob had a question I want to come back to, which is I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. Um, All right, so um, Rob had a great question there about um, virtual shopping, pandemic through the biggest monkey wrench in all of this. Um, and yeah, we're all commuting a lot less. Uh, so I don't think we know yet what's going to happen. Um, there, is, there is less traffic in some places, but it was interesting in downtown Cincinnati, the less traffic there was, the faster the cars went. It was like a drag yeah. race in downtown Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> But pandemic has really pushed, if you're from Cincinnati, for example, you know that in Over the Rhine, they've those restaurants have converted more and more parking space. And it's like, well, we need the parking, but why not why don't the people park in the garage and we'll use those parking spaces for cafe tables? Um, and I think once those restaurants get that, they're not gonna give that back up again. So <laughs> I think we're gonna see a lot of changes like this uh, in the next few years. 
So uh, I have a lot of great comments to you. So, um, so Matthew Forrest commented that these. Hey, Matt Forrest. <laughs> yes. I know that guy. <laughs> so Matt said these look like great improvements. Um, B.W. Patrick said that this is really awesome about the uh, the walking lines around Oxford. Um, and then I have a couple of Oxford specific questions that have come in. I think people might um, be seizing on the opportunity to get some inside scoop from you. Okay. So um, one question that came in about Oxford, I'll give you both of them. And if they uh, connect, then uh, you can answer them together. Um, so there was a question of uh, whether you thought the city of Oxford would ever consider blocking um, High Street to vehicles uptown. Um, and then the other question was, um, goodness, we had several more come in. Uh, when will the High Street Islands start and finish? And I assume that's traffic calming uh, median islands. So yeah, I'll start first with the traffic islands. Um, okay. Oxford and Miami are partnering on that and they're going to be reconstructing High Street um, this summer. So they'll construct those islands, they'll repave the street, um, and I'm assuming hopefully it will be done by August, but that stuff's going out to bid. It's a good question about um, High Street. In the, in the 1960s, a lot of cities experimented with pedestrianizing their main streets. And unfortunately in the 1960s, that usually resulted in killing all the businesses. Um, mm -hmm. Because parking, you know, people in a car, in a, in a society in which 85% of people do their trips by car, mm -hmm. um, in some cities like Burlington, Vermont, they've done that, it's been quite successful. Mm -hmm. We dipped our toe into that this summer with something called a free, like, I don't remember what it was called, Red Brick Fridays, where we closed mm -hmm. off High Street for basically an open air way for people to kind of, we have a designated alpha refreshment area, you can get a bar. It also coincided with the, the Dora thing, right? Yeah, so we have a door and, and the power of walking up and, I mean, High Street on a Friday night with stuff outside mm -hmm. was really magical. Um, and I think we're gonna go back to that. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that cars are an essential part, vehicles are an essential part of the transportation mix. Mm -hmm. so I think it's, but it's, if it's equity, like they have to have a place too. It's just, I think there's ways of dialing it down. Um, one could ask that question on campus too. Like should all of our streets be vehicular streets or should some of them be pedestrianized? Uh, it's, it's an ongoing process, I think. So I'm trying to decide which question to relay to you next, uh, David, because there's so many good ones. Um, I'll, I'll read a couple of comments. Okay. Uh, Sarah says, a community near me recently closed a few downtown streets to vehicles and to allow for pedestrian use and outdoor dining. It worked so well this past year that they have extended the closure to 2022. Um, and then we also had someone who said, Mark says, it's great to hear about changes for Crossing Patterson. I was a freshman in 1979 when Bachelor first opened. It was dangerous as students were crossing Patterson with minimal traffic assistance. And then um, a, a comment from CDH in Brooklyn, the pedestrian plazas in Times Square and along Broadway really helped alleviate overcrowded and unsafe sidewalks that resulted in pedestrians spilling out into what had been vehicle traffic lanes. Um, so those are just uh, some comments. Yeah, Tell let me just um, well, let me just address those ones about yeah. the idea of the the, the street closures. Um, I think that that's like a, a huge frontier that's coming. Um, in part, there have been movements uh, starting, for example, there's something called the open and free streets movement. So people who live in Philadelphia or Detroit, or uh, they do this and they'll do it like on a Sunday, for example, so you can walk and bike and it's one big continuous thing. To me, it's once you crack that open, once you allow people to walk on the streets, you allow businesses to set up space, Again, if you think about like this as a rights issue to public space, then people people start saying, well, hey, like that's valuable real estate and there's competition for it. And so I think once, for example, businesses see the opportunity, like Times Square, that was good for pedestrians and it's great for business too. Um, and so I think a lot of business interests, the business community is gonna be pretty interested in expanding uses of public space for designated outdoor dining 
or temporary or events. Um, but yeah, I, it was the point about Bat, uh, Patterson, my predecessor, Jim Rubenstein, I mean, he and his students, at, at, and it wasn't that long ago, there were barely marked crosswalks on campus. Mm -hmm. um, so it was. it's always been a walkable campus, but it's really been more kind of intentionally careful about that in the last 10 years, and it's really fun to see the changes. Right. So B.W. Patrick asks, changing infrastructure is one thing, but how do you change behaviors as well? Well, this is really, really interesting. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a big believer, and this is because I'm a geographer and a planner, is that I think space and the way space is structured and infrastructure is, is, is structured it has a lot of behavior, it, 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 it affects behavior. Um, so for example, take speed limits. Um, you can have speed limits, you could pass a speed limit. The speed limit has always been like 35 or 25 through campus. But if you make a roadway 60 feet wide, nobody goes 25. You know, the, en the engineering tells you to go 50. Um, so, and all the police cars and all the warning, um, but if you narrow a street, the engineering cues tell you, you know, to go slow. And, and there's an analog to this in public health, which is you can run campaigns to, for example, tell people to walk, to be healthy, to do this. And, and those campaigns might work for a little while, but they don't stick. But if you give, put people in a spatial structure, like any of us who, for example, have ever spent any time in Manhattan, you don't go there intending to get 20,000 steps a day, <laughs> but you do. And it's not because you set out to walk 12 miles. It's just, you're trying to get to the museum and then you use, and then over the course of the day, the structure of the town, you have not been inside a vehicle all day and you've walked your butt off. Um, and so I think it's the power of the structure to, to shape the behavior. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so the infrastructure and the behavior go together. I think that's super interesting. Um, so here's a question from um, from Anne. It seems like a simple question, but I'm gonna guess it's not. Yeah. How does politics fit in to a reimagining the streets? Well, this is what's so interesting about why this is political, but in, in the past it was just, it seemed apolitical because it was just engineering, right? We just need to engineer for the cars because all their uses had been so engineered out, they didn't even claim at all. Um, but once, for, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to overstate the example, but it's a little bit like any civil rights movement. If people are so thoroughly excluded, they can't even go to the ballot box to exercise their right. You don't hear from them because they're silenced. Once you open it up, and, and, and this, this is the complete streets idea, once you let people bicycle in the street and you walk, then all of a sudden those people advocate for their own interests. And, and the street is political, like it's public space. How we allocate those resources, how, what money we invest in them, who yields to whom, that's politics. I mean, it's political. And the more people you let into the street, it doesn't get less political. You know, think about the business interests. I mean, uh, if all of a sudden now we have business interests creating cafes, then the question is like, well, what about the parking? And 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 that might that and and what you do for transit might impede the vehicles. But that might, I mean, bike you, you know, bike lanes are super. I well, we had a person for Brooklyn here. The politics mm -hmm. of bike lanes are intense. You know, because what's good for a cyclist running across town may not be good for a resident who uses who used to being able to park in front of their place. Um, it's very, very complicated. But to me, it's you have to first understand it's political and apply some of the standards we use in politics, which is like, okay, let's make sure everyone has a voice. Like all those other things we use to help do political things like uh, allocate resources, the street should be open to that. But like even in Oxford, those decisions have been made by engineers without any democracy at all. Mm -hmm. um, so part of my the project is is open it up so we can have a conversation, uh, and those will be political conversations. So we have a comment and a question from <clears throat> Jim, class of eighty four. He says, um, "COVID has really opened up the downtown in my small town, in California, with outside and open seating that makes it more inviting. I hope it survives post COVID." My question goes to the expense of all this. 
it seems a road to be far cheaper than a multi-use space. How in these tax averse times and with such high expenses from COVID does all this sell in communities? Well, one of the interesting things to me, and, and this isn't, this is something that causes my maybe more progressive colleagues worried some, is that Complete Streets Coalition, one of the partners in that was the National Association of Realtors. Because mm -hmm. realtors know that, you know, quality of life, accessibility makes property more valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and parking can be part of that, but I think increasingly they're seeing that there's a lot of real estate in the heart of the city that could be used for other things. A, if we just make the street safer and nicer, it makes the person with the front porch next to it, it makes that property more valuable. Mm -hmm. But I think as we start thinking about like, oh, that little parklet that we create a parking space and now it's leased out as a business interest, like that generates tax dollars. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, but like storing a vehicle for 50 cents an hour, I mean, think about how big a parking space is. That's like nine by, you know, often they're like eight feet by 20 feet. 160 feet that you can rent in the heart of a city for a dollar an hour. It's maybe the economics, maybe there's other more profitable uses of that space. And I think once we start thinking of it like that, then people start seeing the interests. Um, the other thing is, is it's just like all that, that the roadway infrastructure is really not as, it's costly. Um, I'm just a believer that there are other perhaps higher and better uses, for example, like we need space for other things and not just storing cars. So you can hit the economics and the sustainability thing uh, too. I mean, climate change is, is not gonna be cheap to fix, but there may be some win-wins in there with, with our streets. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Um, and so one of those actually, I'm just gonna share as a comment. Um, so um, someone on, a viewing on YouTube said, Lakewood, Ohio is well designed for pedestrians and bikers. Most students walk to school and Lakewood has dedicated bike lanes. Lakewood is a very popular Cleveland, Cleveland suburb, partly because of this. And so based on what you were just saying, David, I'm going to guess that real estate is not inexpensive in Lakewood, Ohio. Well, um, it's so interesting because places like Lakewood, I have my students in my urban geography classes read about the history of Lakewood. And Lakewood was designed like most American places were maybe a hundred century and a half ago, it was a streetcar suburb. You you walked hmm. around the neighborhood and then you took the streetcar to your job in downtown Cleveland. Um, that was a really efficient way to run an American city. And it took a while to undo that and make our places hmm. more auto dependent. But yeah, again, even in those places, I bet people in Lakewood have cars, but they don't need to use them for every trip. And that to me is the difference. Like. I want to have a car so I can drive up to Houston Woods, but I don't want to be forced to have to use it for every single trip to go anywhere. And and that's mm -hmm. why property values are so high in some of those walkable neighborhoods. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, Manhattan, you don't need a car at all. So you can give up that automobile and put that money into real estate or mm -hmm. you know rents or whatever. Um, it, so that comes down to an equity issue too. I mean, cars are expensive mm -hmm. to operate, particularly for poor people. Um, mm -hmm. Not having to own a car, means you can put your money towards something else. Um, Hector, watching along, uh, mentioned a comment about double-decker parking spots, and I've seen those uh, in a few places. Um, maybe we could see more of those. Uh, so the last question I wanted to relate to you, Margie says, what about truck routes in Oxford? Ah. And that's an interesting one to end on, right? Yeah, the truck route thing is really complicated. Miami has kind of almost effectively taken care of this by creating all those traffic islands and and the cars are they they the trucks are actually moving now along Chestnut Street and Locust. Mm -hmm. What I've always said in Oxford is the trucks seem bad, but at least the drivers are professional. <laughs> Our <laughs> students are the ones I want to get off the streets uh, because mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of training and their minds are often on other things. So I want them walking and biking. And if we have some trucks, that maybe is the price of living on a US route and and uh so yeah, it's hard. We have to balance all these things. That trucks are part mm -hmm. of these too. Well, um, what what a great conversation, David. Thank you so much for leading us through this today. Um, I will say that our next um, session coming up is with Dr. Um, Annie Deloria, and it is 
from enchantment to protest, projection and moving images in public spaces. And so you'll be able to watch that um, on this same website. Um, thank you just so much to everybody who submitted a great question um, or comment. I don't think I was able to get to all of them, but we're just really grateful for the conversation. And that's exactly why we do these kinds of presentations to um, help people reconnect back to Miami with one another, to challenge what we think we know, and to be students again for a day. So thank you so much, David, for your time and for sharing your research and your expertise with us. Thank you so much. And uh, someday we'll all be doing this in person again. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thank you to Michelle and Emily for facilitating this. It and it's really a pleasure. So everyone have a great um, alumni winter weekend. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank thanks. You.